All right, good afternoon. I'd like to get started. So a few classes ago, we started talking about energy. And uh, I mentioned that energy is it's an abstract concept. It's a calculated concept. So you find yourself doing things like 1 half times the mass of something times its velocity squared or something like that. It's a calculated quantity, but extremely useful in understanding how the world works. So we physicists have been on this path for millennia now, trying to figure out how the world works. And we've developed, well, this class started with Newton's Laws, 1686. That's a very solid framework for understanding how the world works. And that's pretty much how most things work, is that if you push on something, it'll accelerate. If you want to change something's state of motion, you need to push on it. Using those Newton's laws, we can just sort of massage and rework Newton's laws, and we end up with this whole idea of energy. And energy ends up being a very useful thing that we've talked about in the last few classes for understanding how the world works. And so we can understand that when I drop a ball, this ball right now, relative to the floor of this classroom, this ball has gravitational potential energy. And when I drop it, I'm going to watch that ball do what everything in this universe likes to do, and that is lower its gravitational potential, or lower its energy, lower its energy level. And I'm going to watch it lower that potential energy, but convert that into something else. You can't destroy energy. That energy just doesn't lower. It gets converted into kinetic gets converted into kinetic. Now, the nice thing about rubber balls, the nice thing about rubber balls is that they're rubber, they're elastic. And actually, the whole picture of what happens when I do that is that I watch gravitational potential energy get converted into kinetic energy. That kinetic energy increases while the potential decreases. And then actually, I don't think we talked about this when we were talking about energy, but in an when I've got an elastic springy super ball like this, what happens is at the floor, that energy that is now kinetic energy has lost all its potential. It's now completely into kinetic. That kinetic energy goes into elastic energy. This thing deforms. This thing deforms. It squishes. And so for a millisecond, if you had a high speed camera, for a millisecond, it's squished at the floor. And the nice thing about bouncy balls is that it that deformation, that squish, is what we call elastic, meaning I can get it back. Elastic deformation is non-permanent. I can get it back. When I take away the forces, it'll go back to its original shape. And so this ball will actually hit the floor, deform, and then it'll return to its original shape. In other words, all the energy that went into squished rubber goes back into kinetic and back into potential. And I'm not going to get it all back, but like, not even close. Um, yeah, it's not the bounciest ball I've ever seen, but pretty good. I could throw it down there. Um, and so I'm gonna, it's going to deform elastically, then I'm going to get most of that energy back, a good chunk of it anyway, and then it's going to go back into potential. And if in an ideal world, all of that it would have ended up back at the same height. So I'm losing a little bit there. It would have ended up back at the same height. So I would have seen potential kinetic, spring, kinetic potential. OK. So we've, we've developed another framework, another way of understanding the world. Today I want to give us our third and final framework or lens through which we can look at the world. And so we physicists, again, it's, all, it's still based on Newton's laws, it's still based on the idea that there's stuff and then there's the forces between that stuff. But we can develop another way to look at the world, and this one called momentum is going to be particularly useful for us in a couple specific types of situations. Most importantly, in what I'll just hmm. there we go. Most importantly, this new uh, framework is going to be important for what I will categorize as explosions and collisions. And I can I can group a lot of things into what I would call an explosion. Explosion is any time I see some. One, two or more things moving away from each other. So I have some system, maybe just two people standing here, or an actual explosive thing, but uh, something that goes flying away. 
that would be what I call an explosion. And so in that category of explosions, I would, like I said, just two people pushing on each other. I would call that an explosion. When you, when you have a multi-body system, they're pushing on each other. And then, or the reverse of an explosion is a collision. So anytime I have a multi-body system of things coming together, we'll call that a collision. And I, let's talk about why this idea of momentum turns out to be very useful in those types of situations. So yeah, let's talk about that. So again, it's based on, it's based on Newton's second law. That should be familiar to us, F equals MA. Now, I don't think I've written A as delta V over delta V before, but there it is. Now, I'm about to pull up a couple more equations. I try to keep equations to a minimum in this class. I think the equations in this case, again, aren't going to be for computation, but more for just understanding where this come fr comes from. And so, so far, all you're seeing up there is Newton's second law. We're seeing F equals MA, and then A, as we know, is the rate of change of velocity. If you're changing velocity, you're accelerating. Now, I've said this a couple times before, uh, but it's worth repeating that in physics, rates of change are extremely important. That Newton invented calculus because as he was working on his understanding of the world, he didn't have the math sufficient to deal with changing quantities. Algebra is great if you want to calculate the side of a triangle. But if the side or sides of that triangle are changing, you need something a little better than algebra. And so Newton invents calculus because physics is about change. And so anytime I have divided by change in time, we know that capital delta, we know that capital delta means change. So that's what that's saying. That says change in time. And so anytime you see change in time or per time, that's a rate. When I go to the bank, my interest rate is like interest per year or per month or per day or something like that. When you go to the doctor and you maybe stick your finger in a machine and it gives you your heart rate, that's usually in beats per minute. So anytime you have something per time, another word for that is rate. We've already talked about power is rate of change of energy. So change of energy per time. Let's see, even velocity is a rate. Velocity is distance per time. So anytime you have per time, that's a rate. Okay. So acceleration there, there's my, there's my acceleration is just rate of change of velocity, just velocity per time. If I multiply both sides, here we are doing some math, but I think it's useful. Uh, if we multiply both sides by time, we get that fancy formula. Fat mav, some people say. Basically, all, I'm, all I've done is I've just multiplied both sides by time. And right there, I'm already basically at this, con this concept called momentum. And I'll go one more forward. Yeah, there we go. Let's put the delta on the outside. So here's what we can do with a very quick, simple reorganizing of Newton's second law. We can arrive at a new, two new calculated quantities. Two new quantities, force times time, and another calculated quantity, mass times velocity. So basically, we're, re we're introducing, so we have force. We know what that is. That's just a push or pull. Time, we know what that is. We have already talked about mass. We know what velocity is. So we haven't introduced any new real physical quantities, but I've grouped them differently, and I'm going to refer to them differently. So I'm going to refer to mass times velocity as one thing, and that's what we call momentum. And it's another one of those words that I think comes up enough in normal speaking language that in physics we need to make sure we've defined it properly. So we all know that UVA likes to bring more momentum into the second half or something like that. That, I don't know what other source times you, you just, you hear momentum just even use, oh yeah, that guy had a lot of momentum. But in this case, that's, that means something specific and it means mass times velocity. Now, arguably, I think as humans we're trying to understand the world, I think we prob, there's something a little bit innate about the understanding of momentum. I think mass can be misleading. Something can be very massive but small. You could have a little lead ball or something like that, or you could have a big, huge ball of styrofoam. So mass sometimes is misleading. The fact that you, when you have no weight, you still have mass when, you, when you're in space. Like that, that, that concept is a little bit, I think, sometimes just harder to wrap your head around. Velocity, rate of change of position. Maybe that's not the most intuitive quantity, but mass times velocity, we get that. I think a caveman 
probably wasn't scared of a boulder just sitting there. That's just a very massive object. But a boulder moving towards you is scary. And so I think we have this intuitive sense that those two things together are scary. And so bullets are quite small, but give them enough velocity and they're scary. As are most small projectiles. Anything, you could take a little pebble and get it going fast enough and you should get out of its way. So the, this, thing called, this thing called mass times velocity, that's what we call momentum. And that's, that is a whole quantity that we can use. And so how do I change the momentum of something? I give it an F delta T, which we call an impulse. So there's our two new terms for the day, impulse and momentum. So all I've done is I've taken Newton's second law, rearranged a little bit, and I have two new ideas. There's something called impulse and there's something called momentum. I took force, mass, and acceleration and rearranged them, and I have impulse, and that is simply pushing on something for a certain amount of time. So I push on something for a certain amount of time, that's an impulse. So again, that's why the formula is up there, not for computational reasons, but to show you that's what, how we do it. We push for a little amount of time and you're giving an impulse. Or another way to think of it, actually two more ways to think of it. If you push on something for an amount of time, you are going to change its momentum. That's a given. If you push on something for any amount of time, you will change its momentum. And another way to think of it, and here's maybe the best, maybe one of the most useful things about this concept that we'll talk about today. And that is if you don't push on something for any amount of time, its momentum won't change or is conserved. And again, one of the reasons we bring up the concept of energy and one of the reasons we bring up the concept of momentum, their main utility sometimes, often, usually, comes from when they are conserved. And so I can trust that the, mem the momentum of a system is conserved if there's nothing pushing on it. And that is where the main utility is. And that's, and I think from there we can see why it's maybe useful in terms of collision. So let's take a look at an example. I have, let's start with these guys. So I'm going to take these guys, we've seen these I think on the first or second day of class. This is my little air hockey puck. A little fan shoots air out of here, creates a little cushion, and it can move almost without friction. So when it's on, when it's on it just kind of glides across the table. So here's how, here's the, how I'm going to work that. I'm a, I have a stationary hockey puck, another stationary hockey puck. If I look at this puck puck system, I'm, ac I'm external to the puck puck system. So I'm going to come along and I'm going to apply a force for a certain amount of time to one of these guys. So I am an external agent that's going to come along and add an impulse to the puck puck system. That's going to get one of these guys moving. Once I'm done pushing, there's no more forces. There's no friction. There's nothing else. There's no net forces. To the to external to the system. So the momentum, and here again, this is the whole utility of this idea. The momentum of the system will be conserved. I can trust that. That if there's no force, F equals zero, delta, well, let's put one more, let's rewrite this one more time. P is for momentum. I forget why, I think it's from the Latin. I forget. Okay. So let's look at the la that last way of phrasing it is the easiest way to think of it. If there's no force, there's no delta P. In other words, the momentum of the system won't change. And let's be careful about thinking about systems. So maybe in this class this is the first time we've had to be careful about thinking about the system because we're going to be talking about multi-body systems and I want to be able to think about what counts as the system and what counts as outside of the system. So the two pucks, that's the system. This is my puck-puck system. Then I'm external to that. I'm going to apply a force. I'm going to start this guy going. This guy now has momentum. He's got mass and he's moving. He's then going to collide with this other puck and they have Velcro on them so they're going to stick. He's going to collide with that one. There are no forces external to the system even during that collision. So during that collision, this guy's pushing on this guy, this guy's pushing on this guy, but external to the system, there's no forces. So momentum will be conserved. I'll end up with the same momentum before and afterwards. And you might be able to see in the math, you might be able to see in the math that the total momentum of the system is this guy coming in here. That's the total momentum of the system. He's not moving. He doesn't bring any momentum to the system. Afterwards, they're going to be moving together. So the amount of mass moving just doubled after the collision. 
So this guy was the only one moving. Now the mass doubled. You might be able to see in the math that should mean, if in an ideal world, that their velocity is halved to keep the total momentum of the system equal. Let's try it. Right, turn this guy on. He's floating around, hopefully. Turn this guy on. So I'm going to try to get this guy stationary. And then this guy's going to bring some momentum in. And if they stick, if they stick, you'll see their mom the velocity should basically be halved. Same direction, just half the velocity. I'll try that one more time. I guess I can't send him in that, that fast. One more time. There we go. Not bad. OK. So what we see is, again, it's just the unfolding of Newton's third law. Here's what happens. In the collision, this guy sitting here minding the business. Here comes this other guy with some momentum. For a period, they're going to be pushing against each other, equal and opposite, and for the same amount of time. That's important to think about. So uh, during any collision, that's actually true. Take any object, slam them against each other. They will be in contact for some amount of time. They will be pushing on each other. And those pushes will be equal and opposite. We've already talked about that. That's Newton's third law. No way around that. This guy's pushing this guy. This guy's pushing the same, equal and opposite. And that mutual push happens for the same amount of time. This guy feels a force for the same amount of time this guy feels. And if the, they feel the same force for the same amount of time, but the forces are in opposite directions, those two changes cancel out. And that's another reason there's no change in momentum. So there's no change in momentum because this guy's basically imparting momentum to the other guy. There's no overall change. I can take the, uh, the Velcro off of one of these guys so they're not as sticky. And now I'll have, oh, by the way, I should mention that. OK. We learn impulse. We learn momentum. Here's two new terms for the day. What we just watched was an inelastic collision. And so in a, we physicists like to classify our collisions as elastic or inelastic. That was an inelastic collision, meaning they stuck together. They stuck together. So one, there were two bodies, and after the collision, they were one body. That's an inelastic collision. I should mention that one of the nice things about momentum as a framework or as a lens for understanding that situation. Take a guess. Do you think energy was conserved or kinetic energy? Do you think kinetic energy was conserved in that situation where they stuck together? Shake your head no, yes, OK. Kinetic energy was lost in that situation. Anytime you stick two things together, you're probably going to lose some kinetic energy. And so energy ends up being a very difficult framework for collisions. So unless I get a perfect elastic collision, like that bouncy ball, and that wasn't perfectly elastic, unless I get a perfectly elastic collision, then I've probably lost energy. So here's, this one will hopefully be elastic. This one will hopefully be elastic. In other words, these two things will come into contact. They'll both deform, then they'll both spring back to their original shape and they'll keep their kinetic they'll keep their kinetic energy and momentum. So now there's no velcro, hopefully they won't stick. And I should mention if I do it right, if I do it right, they will actually just swap velocities. If you ever played pool, two objects coming in with equal mass and if it's a very nice elastic collision, they will just swap velocities. So this guy, I'm going to try to get one stationary. This other guy will come in with momentum. They'll push on each other for some amount of time. This guy now has all the momentum, and this guy's lost all of it. So if I do it right, they'll, they'll switch. One is moving one stationary, then they'll switch. That guy's hopefully stationary. And then bring this guy in, and pretty much yeah, that works pretty well. Oh, that works out. The fan comes off the table. That's nice. All right. OK. OK. So that was an example of an elastic collision. In an elastic collision, they don't stick together. And an important 
detail of an elastic collision is that energy is also conserved. So if I take an elastic collision, I'm going to get momentum conserved because momentum is conserved in all collisions, but I'm also going to keep my energy too. So in other words, all the deformation that occurred was temporary. They sprung back. But when I, if I want these two guys to stick, the Velcro, actually, all the deforming that happened in the, at the point of Velcro, I lost energy in that. And so, yeah, I think that's enough definition there. Elastic and elastic. Cool. Okay. Let's do an eye clicker. Again, let's see, if I stood here, yeah, if I stood here, 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 okay, this is my bouncy ball. Now, again, uh, different materials are going to have different elastic properties. So rubber and elastic, certain polymers have this nice elastic property that I can bounce this one and again, I don't get all my energy back, but most of that, most of that bounce is, is uh, temporary, but th I've got this other black ball, which they look very similar, but one of them is just kind of dead. And so certain materials have a tendency to take any impact energy and just dissipate it. And so is that on? Yeah. And so I kept trying to catch that. And if I don't remember which one I'm holding, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, so certain, some materials will just take that impact energy and dissipate it, and it won't, you won't get it back. This uh, this piece of wood right here has two sides. I've got a springy side, so I've got silly putty on one side. I've got a material a lot like this on one side. And when I take this little pendulum and hit the material, I'm going to try to knock this block over. What I want to know is can I knock the block over regardless? So I guess that would be, yeah, that would be answer C. Will this just knock it over regardless? Because I'm just bringing energy into collision. The fact that some of it ends up in the clay, some of it ends up in the wood, maybe that doesn't matter. Or maybe does that matter? By absorbing it, is that going to help knock it over? Or by being bouncy, is that going to help knock it over? Or, or no way this little bar is knocking over this big piece of wood. Who knows? That, that would be D. So those are the options. Let's take, let me start my eye clicker here. And let's take a minute and a half. Bless you. And we'll see what. Hold on. Oh, there. Ready, go. Okay. Ten more seconds. Okay. Good. We've got a nice even split-ish. Yeah. Sixty-four, eighty-six. Okay. Let's 
It could be both. I don't know. Uh, let's let's before we before we actually try it, let's discuss a little bit more about a, another detail of momentum. I want to make sure we all get, and that is momentum. I think in this class it's safe to use the word vector. I've told I've used that word before. Momentum is a vector, which just means the direction matters. And here's how that's important for us. In a perfectly elastic collision, I think it's this one. In a perfectly elastic collision, when, I, when this ball hits the ground, it's moving down at some velocity and has some mass. The, it's going to keep its mass. It's not going to change its mass. So I'll leave that up there. Maybe I'll, yeah. So it's going to hit the ground with some velocity. And then it's going to turn around and come back at about that same velocity. If I don't lose any energy, it's just going to turn around and come back. The total change in kinetic energy in that situation is zero, because kinetic energy actually is not a vector, it's a scalar. And so this thing is going to bring some kinetic energy to the floor, however much, I don't care about the number. It's going to bring some kinetic energy to the floor. It's going to squish. It's going to lose all that kinetic energy in a spring. It's going to get all that kinetic energy back. And the change in kinetic energy is zero. When I'm talking about momentum, things are a little different. This thing's going to hit the ground with some velocity. Its momentum is down. Let's just give it a number 10. So the, the momentum is down 10 when it hits the ground. It's going to experience a force for a certain amount of time. That's how I'm going to think about it. It's going to hit the floor. The very instant it hits the floor, it's not feeling much force. That force is going to climb up to some max value. Then it's going to diminish as it's as it's springing back away from the floor. And then when it finally leaves contact with the floor, that force goes to zero. So if you wanted to plot it, the force plot usually looks like an upside down U. It comes in, and then it's max, and then it goes back down to zero. It's going to experience some force for some amount of time. And it's going to come back with a new momentum, because it experienced an impulse. It experienced an upward force for a certain amount of time. That means there had to be an upward change in momentum. And let's say it came in at 10 down. It's going to leave with 10 up for a total change of not 0, but 20. And again, those are made up numbers just to indicate, just to, as an example, that the change in momentum is not 0. It came in, it turned around, and came back the other way at the same velocity. If it brought 10 this way, and then it was leaving with 10 that way, that's a change of 20, which is big. Now, if it came in and just stopped, that's a 10 to 0. And if it comes in and, bounce, comes in and bounces, it's a 10 to negative 10, a change of 20. OK. That has significance for what's going to happen here. So here's what's going to happen. This right now is my non-sticky side. So this is the non-sticky side. So it's going to come in with some momentum into the collision. And then it's going to lose all that momentum, and it's going to impart it to the wooden block. So this block will now have momentum. Let's give it a try. Like yay much. Darn it. Now, it still could be neither. Still could be neither. But if I brought it up to about yay much, I don't quite get the block to fall over. So here's what's going on. I'm letting this thing go. It's gathering momentum. And when it hits the block, it's going to impart, it looks like, just about all of its momentum. Yeah, eventually all of it. Eventually, all of its momentum is imparted to the block, but the block doesn't topple. The block bar system has no forces external to it. So there's no change in momentum to the block bar system. So if this thing brings in some, comes to a stop. So let's say it brings in 10. It came to a stop. Now the block has all 10. Now, so it imparted 10 to the block. This is my silly putty side. This is the bouncy side. Now, you might be able to realize where I'm going with this at this point. This guy's going to come in. Let's say he comes in with 10. If he leaves with anything going the other direction, that means this guy got more than 10. If he comes in with 10 and leaves with 1 in the other direction, 10 this way to 1 that way is a change of 11. This guy now got all 11. So if, I, if he leaves going the same speed, this guy got double the momentum. Let's see if that works. So this is the same height right there. And I, I guess for the, for the sound effect, I should let it go. I'll let it go this time. OK. So here it goes. Nice sound effect. So I swear, and you can check the video. I swear I'm lifting it to the same height. I'm not trying to trick you or anything. But if I lift it to this height, it's 30 degrees of 
That's 30 degrees right there from vertical. I'm, let's, see if, let's see if we can watch the bar. If you watch the bar, I get a little kickback. I get a little kickback, and that means extra momentum to the block. Or another way to think of it, the block is the guy changing this guy's momentum. If this guy has a change of 10, it came from the block. If it has a change of more, it came, also came from the block. And so by using this bouncy side, I'm getting more, I'm getting more change. OK. Any questions so far? OK. Um, I still have a couple more demos. So let's see. My next couple things I wanted to show, I just I thought about how to safely do this in the in physics 203, and I couldn't think of a. So I try to stay away from videos or like online demos or online simulations because you can get a computer to do anything. So I don't think it's as effective to show. Oh look, here's a computer knocking over a block of wood. I don't, I don't I like try it in the real world. Um, this next one doesn't work in the real world. Because it's a gun, I didn't want to bring a gun in. But it's still one of my favorite examples of conservation of momentum. <laughs> it's great. Um, so here's what's happening. I'll, can I pause a GIF? I don't think I can. So I'll just go back. OK. Um, so here's, I'll, I'll go back to that because I, I get it, I, la I laugh every time. But um, here's what's going on. Here is a. Let's just talk, forget the guy. Here's a gun bullet system. That gun bullet system is at rest. It has no velocity, so the momentum of the gun bullet system is zero. If that bullet leaves with any momentum this way, the gun bullet system has to keep zero. There were no forces external to the gun bullet system, gun bullet, gunpowder, whatever system. So all of that system, no matter what happened inside, something exploded, something pushed on the, I don't know how that all is going on in the inside. But on the outside, the outside had no momentum before he pulled the trigger. There therefore has to be no momentum, no momentum after he pulls the trigger. So all of a sudden in that, in that situation, I have a little mass, like bullets aren't too heavy, but it's going very fast. So MV is large. So I have a little bullet going very fast, MV that way is large. In order to keep the total zero, there has to be some MV this way. So bullet leaves this way, MV also goes this way. And there's no way around that. So if you've ever watched any type of projectile launcher, something has to go this way. Now we've come up with better and better things to absorb all that, but some, if something goes this way, something has to go that way. Momentum has to be conserved. And so if you ever watch like a cannon fired, you don't want to be standing behind a cannon. A lot of times they'll roll back a couple feet after they shoot their projectile. And then, or there's just the dumb guy with a sawed off uh, version, and that's putting your face where you know mass is going to be going this way. And so he gets bonked there. And then he, I got, here's another great one. <laughs> so uh, again, something goes this way. So, and it, you, you can even almost see it. It's a linear, it's linear momentum. Momentum this way means something has to go the opposite direction the other way. And so any kind of recoil, I guess that's that word recoil is just another way to phrase conservation of momentum. You send something that way, you have to go this way. I guess the the less funny way I could have demonstrated that could have brought in the skateboard again or something. And if I want to go this way and I'm standing on the skateboard, I can just throw something that way. And next class, we'll talk about there's some real good implications of that. But uh, let's look at one other. There's that guy, that lady. And this one's not funny, but um, here's also just another good example of the importance of this concept of momentum. So here comes a crash test dummy in a cattle, Lincoln. Here comes a crash test dummy going to hit a wall. And if you are going to experience, if you need to change your momentum, so that crash test dummy has some momentum, some MV. That crash test dummy needs to go from some MV, some momentum, to zero. Here's how you get a change in momentum, F delta T, right? So I'm bringing some amount of momentum into the situation. 
my mass times my velocity, I'm going headed toward that wall. One way or another, I'm going to have to come to a stop. In other words, I'm going to have to transfer my momentum somewhere else. Or another way to say that is I'm going to have to receive an impulse, an F delta T, to bring me to a stop. Well, I've got two, I've got two variables in that equation. I need an F and a delta T to work together to bring me to a stop. Which of those do you think you'd prefer to be very large? The F or the delta T? Well, the delta T, that's right. So uh, there's two ways for me. If I'm walking toward a wall, and maybe I'm wearing skates or something, so I, here comes the wall, I could just do a short stop, and that's a lot of F. Or I can put my arms out and make that whole thing take longer. In both cases, maybe I'll change this camera back. In both cases, I had to go from I have momentum, I have MV, to now I have none. I had to receive an impulse. I'd rather usually have that take longer and less F than the other way around. So really the physics behind an airbag is that, OK, you're going to hit that wall. You're going to come to a stop. Let's see if we can prolong that situation. And so you could hit something rigid like a steering wheel, and it's going to happen pretty quick. What an airbag is trying to do is start the process earlier. So rather than waiting till you have to get all the way to something like the steering wheel, let's see if we can bring the impulse provider up to you. And that's why they shoot out so fast. And all of a sudden, you've got much longer. Now, we're still talking milliseconds. But in, in a car crash, that actually helps. And so rather than try to bring me to a stop in less than a millisecond, I've got two or three milliseconds. That's a, a big change. To, reduce the, the force that I'm receiving. And so crumple zones, and you, there was this idea, I think, a long time ago that, well, a safe car is just a big, rigid car. You don't want that. You don't want a big, rigid car. You don't want just a solid block of steel. Unless you're going like, to hit a smart car or something, then there's other issues involved. But if you're going to run into a brick wall and you're going to come to a stop, a big, rigid car is going to transmit a lot of that impulse straight to you. What you want is. Uh, hoods nowadays are designed to crumple at certain spots. The fenders and the car frame is designed to give way. And so, and then there's the airbag and the seatbelt. By the time you come to a stop, you've maximized the, um, the delta T. You've maximized the amount of time that collision takes, and you've lowered the F you're going to receive as much as possible. OK. Any questions? Yep. question was, what is impulse? That bottom equation, impulse is change in momentum. That's what that bottom equation says. That bottom equation says impulse, a force acting or amount of time, is a change in momentum. Or another way to say it is if you want to change your momentum, and in a car crash you do, you're going to get it by a force acting or amount of time. You want to maximize t so f is less. Cool. OK. Um, Two other real quick examples of that. I think everyone has seen. It's not really on camera. Let's see if I can get this on camera better. I think everyone's seen a Newton's cradle. This is that favorite office executive toy. Sits on people's desks in the movies. This is the physics version. And the physics version is just a demonstration of the same thing. That kind of like this pendulum up here. I can lift one of these guys. I can lift one of these guys. And it's going to bring momentum into collision. That momentum is going to be conserved. And what you'll see is that same amount of momentum comes out the other side. And this whole device is designed in a way to reduce the amount of F on the system. If there's no forces external to the system, then momentum should be conserved. In other words, whatever momentum is there after, our, right before the collision should stay there. And then that's why they kind of go back and forth is because what you're watching is momentum be conserved. Something has to be moving. And if I, if I take two of them, I've doubled the amount of momentum, and momentum is still conserved. Yeah, and I can get two going out the other side. Now, if I were to send two in and see one just go away twice as fast, that would conserve momentum. But this is also. These are also elastic collisions, so energy is conserved. 
And that would actually violate conservation of energy because twice as fast means four times as much energy. So this is, here I'm seeing both energy, pretty much energy and momentum conserved. This, go, this can go for a while. So clearly, we're losing some energy to sound, but not much. This, this goes for a good amount of time. And again, I'm seeing momentum conserved. I get, I'm not sure if I've ever tried with three. I'm assuming they'll just do that. There. There it is. And so they're just swapping momentum back and forth. Okay. okay. One last uh, example, and I think we're going to be done for the day. And let's take a look at, well, I'm going to take my two elastic, hopefully pretty, jeez, not so elastic. Hopefully this one. Not, not, not very elastic either. Okay, well, we'll see if this works. Two semi-elastic uh, balls here where I'm going to drop this one from some height and it's going to hit the ground with some amount of momentum. That This ball is much heavier, significantly heavier than the tennis ball. This ball is going to, I'm going to drop them together actually. There we go, like that. I'm going to drop them together. They're both going to hit the ground and for an instant, the basketball is actually going to switch directions and collide with the tennis ball. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have an elastic collision. They're going to fall together. They're going to be moving at the exact same speed when they hit the ground. Galileo told us that. That's pretty much true. They're going to hit the ground at going the same speed. But right at, as they hit the ground, this basketball is going to deform quickly, turn around, and get going the other way and collide with a downward pointing tennis ball. I'm going to have an elastic collision. And for in order for momentum to be conserved, in which it should, its momentum is always conserved in a collision, for momentum to be conserved, this basketball has this large upward momentum. It's pretty heavy, and it's going this way. So after the collision, it's going to impart a lot of momentum to the tennis ball. So in the collision, the tennis ball is actually still going to be headed down, but quickly receive an upward impulse, and it should then leave going, I think, faster than it started. Neither of these are super elastic, so we'll see how well that goes. Yeah. And so I think that's slightly unexpected to see it go that fast. We'll try that one more time. So again, this tennis ball by itself doesn't even get to like a third of its original height, right? And same with the basketball. So neither of these are terribly elastic. But together, I can get a pretty good elastic collision. And that tennis ball goes pretty high after that collision. OK. I think that's it. We'll see you Wednesday.